Hello and welcome to the lesson on assessment in online courses. My name is Russ Sovorov and I'm a language technology specialist at the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. And my uh, co-presenter is Adolfo Carigio Cabello, who is a professional development specialist at the College of Liberal Arts Language Center at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities. Uh, the objective of this presentation is um, the objectives are the following. By the end of this module, you should be able to describe the key concepts related to assessment, differentiate among different types of assessment, explain affordances and constraints of using technology for assessment, recognize best practices in online assessment, and revise some online assessment tools and applications used in online language courses, as well as additional resources. So let's first talk about key concepts in assessment. Uh, people oftentimes use assessment and evaluation interchangeably. However, there are important differences uh, between these two terms. Assessment usually focuses on the learning pro process and um, it is used to identify weaknesses to improve learning. We can say that assessment is process oriented. Evaluation on the other hand focuses on the outcomes and identifies the effectiveness of what has been learned. So we can say that evaluation is more product oriented. When we talk about assessment, it is important to be familiar with the concept of backward design. As you know, there is a separate module on this topic, so you can learn more about it uh, there. But uh, just to summarize briefly, the, the idea behind the backward design is that we start developing the course not with the uh, materials and um, uh, instruction, but we start uh, from the very end. That is, uh, we first need to define the student learning outcomes and course objectives. What exactly do we want the students to be able to do by the end of the course? So once we have those student learning outcomes identified, we need to think about how we're going to evaluate whether the students have achieved uh, those objectives. And that's where the assessment comes into play. And once we have the assessment um, activities and tasks identified, then we uh, should start working on the instruction and learning experience that is developing the content for our course. Uh, another key concept in assessment is rubrics and gradebooks. Uh, uh, rubrics are especially important in online courses as all the assignments, uh, all the assessment tasks that you put into your course have to come with rubrics. And we will talk about rubrics in greater detail later in this uh, module. Other key concepts that uh, some people might not be familiar with are really critical. These are the concepts of validity, reliability, authenticity, washback, and construct. When we talk about validity in assessment, uh, we, uh, validity has to do with whether the assessment tasks measures what it purports to measure. In other words, does the task that we design really measure what we want this task to measure? Reliability has to do with the consistency of the results that the assessment tool produces. In other words, does the measurement produce consistent results? So for example, if we administer the same test or quiz to our students a week later, will the results be more or less the same? Another concept is authenticity. Authenticity has to do with how uh, similar or represent uh, the, how similar the assessment tasks to real life tasks. In other words, what we give our students to do, how much does it resemble what they will have to do in a real in the real life? Uh, with regards to washback, washback has to do with the effect of assessment tasks on language teaching and learning. And the final concept here is construct. What ability or skill does the task intend to measure? So when we talk about constructs in language assessment, we talk about the abilities and skills that the assessment uh, tools are designed to measure. Now let's talk about different types of assessment. There are three main types of assessment, diagnostic, formative, and summative. And most of you might have uh, heard about these terms. Some people, as you might know, put diagnostic type of assessment under formative assessment, but others uh, separate those um, 
So when we talk about diagnostic assessment, uh, this is the type of assessment that is designed to gather information about learners' current proficiency and readiness for the course. Um, it helps to identify weaknesses that uh, we as instructors will later need to address in the course. And it also helps us to establish a baseline that we can use to measure learners' progress throughout our online course. As far as formative and summative assessments go, uh, formative assessment is the type of assessment that we can say it's assessment for learning, whereas summative assessment is it is assessment of learning. Uh, as you can see in this uh, table, it provides a um, comparison uh, between these two um, types of assessment. So for formative, the purpose of formative assessment is to improve learning and achievement, whereas the purpose of summative assessment is to measure or audit attainment. Formative assessment is carried out while learning is in the progress, whereas summative assessment is carried out from time to time to create snapshots of what has happened. Uh, formative assessment focuses on the learning process and the learning progress, whereas summative assessment focuses on the products of learning. Uh, we can say that formative assessment is also an integral part of the teaching learning process, whereas summative assessment is something separate. It is uh, an activity performed after the teaching learning cycle. Formative assessment is also collaborative. Um, it is uh, something that teachers and students do in order to know where they stand um, in, the, in, the, um, in the semester. Teacher uh, direct, uh, summative assessment is more teacher directed. It is something that teachers assigned, assigned to students um, and then evaluate how the students um, completed the assignment. Formative assessment is fluid, whereas summative assessment is more rigid. In formative assessment, teachers and students adopt the role of intentional learners, whereas in summative assessment, teachers adopt the role of auditors and students assume the role of the audited. And finally, in formative assessment, teachers and students use the evidence together to make adjustments for continuous imp improvement, whereas in summative assessment, Teachers use the results to make final success or failure decisions about a relatively fixed, fixed set of instructional activities. Um, when we talk about ass assessment in online courses, it is important to talk about the affordances and constraints. So affordances in online assessment uh, are multiple. Uh, one affordance is that Doing assessment online comes with convenience and flexibility. We can, for example, design a quiz, and uh, while it will perhaps take time to put it together in an uh, online course, we can then easily distribute it to different classes of students uh, who, who, who take the same, um, the same subject. Um, Unlike assessment in face-to-face -face, uh, situations, paper-based assessment, online assessment allows, you, uh, allows for using multimedia for creating input, that is assessment tasks. For example, you can create um, a listening comprehension task uh, in which the students will need to play the video uh, and then answer the questions about that video later. And you can also use multimedia for output. That is, you can have your students uh, record audio or video-based responses to the assessment tasks. Online assessment also allows for integrated assessment. And by integrated assessment, we mean the types of assessment uh, where you use different types of prompts to generate the output from the students. So for example, in an online course, you can create integrated assessment where you give students, for example, a lecture that they need to uh, watch, a video of a lecture, on a specific topic, let's say history. Then they, they, um, the students receive a text that they need to read on a similar topic uh, related to the topic of the video. And then um, their task is to, uh, for example, synthesize the information from those two sources and write an essay. Uh, Online assessment also um, provides automated scoring capabilities. Uh, if you, uh, and these vary from uh, such simple things as having multiple choice questions that are automatically uh, graded by, let's say, an, a learning management system, 
to uh, capabilities that are provided by, for example, automated writing evaluation systems that are capable of providing uh, feedback on students' writing, or automated, um, uh, automated uh, s systems that use um, um, automated speech recognition software. And in online assessment, you can also use new, ta uh, new task types that you cannot use in paper-based assessment. For example, you can create uh, drag and drop items where the students need to uh, drag uh, options and drop them into a specific area. Uh, online assessment also comes with constraints. So these constraints have to do with task design and development issues. Uh, for example, it might be uh, challenging for an instructor who develops a assessment to use a new platform or tool uh, to create uh, assessment tasks. There are accessibility issues. For example, if you use multimedia in online assessment, some of your students might have problems uh, with playing it. Uh, it might require special plugins. Administration and proctoring can also be an issue. Uh, whereas it's relatively easy to proctor um, assessment in a face-to-face -face environment, proctoring online presents additional challenges where the teacher uh, cannot necessarily easily monitor um, students um, uh, who complete the assessment. Uh, plagiarism is another issue in online assessment. And finally, um, online assessment is a relatively time-consuming endeavor it is time consuming in the sense that uh, it takes time to create uh, on assessment tasks uh, in online courses, but it also time consuming in the sense that it uh, takes time to provide detailed comments. For example, if you use track changes uh, to provide feedback on written assignments, uh, it oftentimes takes quite a bit of time. Uh, now, uh, I will pass on to my colleague, Adolfo Carigi Cabello, who will talk about best practices in online assessment. I want to start by pointing out that the information we are presenting in these sections it is uh, related to um, research findings, but also for our teaching experiences, teaching courses online. Um, so some of the best practices we have identified, again, with empirical research and from uh, our own teaching experiences is that uh, one of the things that you want to integrate is providing feedback at different intervals throughout the semester. And this is very important, especially considering the fact that there tends to be a tendency for students to drop out of online courses. You want to keep them informed of their progress at all times. So therefore, it is particularly uh, uh, important to make sure that they, you're, they are provided with feedback at different points throughout the semester. You also want to space them out so that it is consistent and they, you don't provide five commentaries during the first week and then you space for the next two weeks. So just uh, spacing is also another important consideration. Um, in on an online environment, you have the option of providing the students with different forms of uh, input, uh, and this applies also to the idea of feedback. Not only you can deploy uh, information about numerical grades, but you can also provide them with commentaries in the form of text or audio, which I will cover uh, in, in a minute. Uh, you also need to consider that some of the information that you will make available for feedback to students is also available on demand. Uh, and this is an important consideration, uh, considering that uh, uh, there is a lot of information that you can make available to students, but you don't want to make it available all at once. So having that abil ability to display the information on demand is something that you should consider when incorporating uh, feedback uh, for your students. Um, also, some of these features may not be available in all uh, the course management systems that are available at your institution. So uh, another consideration can be that uh, if there are limitations in terms of the types of feedback you can uh, provide to students, there may be some software uh, that you want to incorporate to facilitate uh, the assessment process, but also for allowing 
some other options for feedback and uh, allowing for consistency and assist you in the creating of different assignments more rapidly. Um, one of the considerations is that all of these options require a learning curve. So some of the functionalities will demand from you some uh, learning as to what are the options that are available and how you can incorporate them uh, in the different tasks and different assessments and at what points in the uh, assessment process you want to deploy them. And again, I will provide you with some examples in a minute. Um, you also want to make sure that you uh, have the ability to uh, map out for the students what are the learning objectives and provide them with consistency across the board in terms of how do those uh, are relevant to the specific task they are completing and how do those relate to the actual outcomes of the course. And this can be easily done by incorporating rubrics. Uh, rubric is a great way to bridge this information and it's something that you might want to consider integrating for all of your tasks and all activities that uh, have a great value attached to them as part of their coursework. When creating rubrics, a good starting point is by considering the performance descriptors that ACTFL has made available uh, for all modes of communication and also for the different uh, levels of proficiency. When creating rubrics, one thing to consider is that, is that there are two types of rubric. One is holistic and one is analytic. The holistic rubric uses a single general scale for, for performing a global rating, whereas the analytic uses different categories, each of which has its own scale. A holistic rubric, for example, would be more, uh, more used for global grading. You assign a global score with consideration to one scale. In the example, you can see that the scale is provided on the, uh, in terms of the scores, and the descriptors uh, tap into different features uh, of the same uh, assignment. So for instance, if you're grading a composition, you can uh, grade different elements of that uh, task. Um, for example, uh, transitional phrases, grammar, punctuation, all uh, fit into the same uh, scale with one descriptor. On the other hand, with an analytic rubric, you can separate this information by providing a different scale two different categories of components of the assignment. So in the same example, a writing composition, you can separate the grading of content, organization, or grammar and mechanics, uh, each of which will have its own uh, scale. Some characteristics of effective grading rubrics include providing a criteria for assessment of the performance that is expected from students. You would need to provide detailed descriptions as to what are the levels of performance expected and also be consistent in terms of what are the actual benchmarks that you are after. This will ensure that you uh, increase the validity of your rubric. So being consistent uh, between where you assign uh, a grade of five and four, how is that different? Uh, that level of difference needs to be consistent with the same between a four and a three. Uh, you will need to provide enough details that allow uh, students to make sense of the actual outcomes, but also that avoid ambiguity. Uh, this will ensure that other people are also able to use your rubrics to grade the same component in the same way that you have anticipated to do it. So in, in, in other words, increasing the reliability of your uh, grading instrument. 
Some features of online grading rubrics uh, allow you to uh, differentiate between different uh, formats uh, for grading. So for instance, you will need to decide whether the rubric you're using uh, will be based on letter grades or numerical grades, and also whether or not you are considering percentages or cumulative points as part of the course grade. Uh, you would also need to provide detailed descriptions for each of the categories, uh, presumably for analytic uh, rubrics, again, to avoid ambiguity and avoid repetition. Uh, and one good point is that once you create a rubric, this can be uh, reused or recycled for different purposes. In paper rubrics, you have the ability to provide this information, and this can be readily available in a paper format. However, one difference with online rubrics is that this information can be easily adapted to an online environment, but also there, uh, there's more potential for other uh, customization. In the example uh, that you see on the screen, you can see the different categories with the different skills provided for each category. And this can be set as you would do similarly in a paper rubric. However, in an online environment, you have the ability to change the way in which the point system was instituted. So for instance, if you initially consider uh, a letter a value, a grade value of 50 points, but in the end, you want to make it 100 points. This can be easily changed in an online environment by adapting the different point scale uh, in the uh, online rubric. When you make this consideration, this can also have an impact in the overall course grade. And oftentimes, you will see the need that, uh, to change the initial consideration from numerical to a percentage grade. And again, this can be easily uh, done uh, using the course management features. Some of the information that can be made available for the students include providing them with the specific details of what are the outcomes that you're after for each of the tasks that you have incorporated in your grading rubric. In this way, you can uh, set the course management system to deploy the rubric ahead of time, meaning once the students access the instructions for the assignment, they can immediately see what are the points that will be attributed for each of the components of the task. In this way, once you complete the rubric, the student will have access to very specific information. For example, they will not only be able to see a holistic grade uh, that was given to them or assigned to them as part of the assignment, but specifically what points were given for each of the different categories uh, that were attributed for that task. So in the example on the screen, you can see that the student received high marks on some of the components of the task, but not in others. As Ross mentioned, some of the information that is available for students in terms of feedback has to do with providing commentaries that is uh, uh, readily available in an online environment. Not only you would be able to provide a numerical grade, but also this uh, space can be used uh, to promote active learning. So you can pinpoint to students what specific areas in the assignment you have identified in need of graded attention. Some of the formats of these commentaries uh, are, of course, text-based, but other options available in an online environment are audio commentaries. In this way, you can create a personal connection with the student by uh, recording comments that are not only specific to students, but are coming directly from you in the form of an audio. Some other options available in, uh, for feedback are, are um, um, 
composed of different forms. In the example on the screen, we have text that uh, provides a multi-layer component. So for instance, some of the information that the students have access to, although it stays text-based, it refers to different categories. On the right side of the screen, for example, you can see meta commentaries on the actual essay that the student has written, whereas on the upper part, they can click to specific uh, mistakes that you have marked uh, in, in the same paper. Some other options for grading include um, assistance of specific features of software available for grading. Uh, in, 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 in this case, uh, in the case of Turnitin, uh, it, which is a software used for grading writing assignments, you have the ability to uh, integrate already available codes uh, that you can use to mark the specific parts of the uh, composition by dragging and dropping uh, the different codes that appear on the right hand side of the screen. You can highlight certain areas of the uh, composition and attribute a different code. And you can also customize the codes that are already available. Again, to facilitate and speed up the process of creating the different assignments. I will now pass it on to my colleague, uh, Roslan Subaru, who will tell you about other tools and resources available in online environments. Thank you, Adolfo. Before we conclude our presentation, we would like to draw your attention to some of the um, options that you can use to create assessments in your online courses. Uh, as we've mentioned earlier, some of the challenges in online assessment uh, have to do with proctoring. Uh, there are actually tools that allow you to do online proctoring, such as ProctorU and Proctorio. Uh, what some people do in online courses, some instructors who teach online courses, what they do is they also uh, arrange face-to-face uh, -face proctoring exams uh, in on-site testing centers if such um, resources are available to you at your school or campus. Um, we would also like to mention uh, some of the tools that you can uh, use to design uh, different assessment tasks, such as uh, Google Suite tools. Uh, lots of instructors use Google Forms or Google Classroom. Um, there are uh, standalone uh, applications that allow you to create different types of tests and quizzes, such as Quizlet, Quizzes, Anki. Um, learning management systems have built-in quiz and assessment modules. Uh, when we talk about online assessment, uh, it is uh, also indispensable to mention e-portfolios, and there are different tools that allow you to create those. Uh, there are also audience response systems, such as Poll Everywhere, Socrative, Kahoot, which allow you to uh, gather immediate feedback during the synchronous uh, meetings with your students in the online environment. And uh, there are also automated writing evaluation systems such as Criterion or SciWrite that allow you to do automated assessment of students' writing skills. Uh, we also suggest that you check the PLN tool browser and the ICT tools and open educational resources, the links to which will be available to you in the Dig Deeper section of the TED-Ed lesson. Uh, when we talk about resources, we would also like to draw your attention to the uh, assessment resources provided by Actful, uh, such as Actual Performance Descriptors for Language Learners, Actual Proficiency Guidelines, Nexessful Actual Can Do Statements, Actual Assessments and the Actual Testing Office, as well as the resources from the Center for Applied Linguistics. Um, with regards to the next steps, uh, we would like to invite you to explore the TED-Ed lesson uh, on the topic of assessment in online courses. Uh, check the Dig Deeper section that contains more detailed information about the material that has been covered in this lesson. Ponder over the reflection questions and engage with your mentors. We would also like to acknowledge uh, Actual Distance Learning Special Interest Group and the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, uh, who made this Actual Mentoring Project available to you. 
Thank you very much and good luck with your exploration of assessment in online courses.